Alrighty, welcome everyone to the post-lunch food coma <laughs> section of the conference. I hope that all the breadsticks are sitting in your belly nicely and you'll be fully awake throughout this talk. My name is Nick. I'm a web platform engineer and horse mask enthusiast at Opower. Opower is a company that we're mission driven. We're trying to save the environment by uh, sending people personalized communications about their energy usage and trying to convince them to use less energy. And so far, we have prevented over 6 million tons of CO2 from entering the atmosphere, which is equivalent to taking a million cars off the road for a year. So we're pretty happy about hitting that milestone. And today, I'm going to tell you about how you can make your own programming language. And one thing I was realizing is that uh, as a community, we have a lot of different languages that we use, even though we're called Midwest JS. Like we have these JS comps. We use a lot of different languages and even different versions of the same language. Um, and so I was actually telling someone at the speaker's dinner sort of about this motivation for giving the talk of how we have this interest in compilers and all these JS alternate languages. And this person actually started making like a strangling motion at my neck, uh, I guess because this person thought we already have enough JS alternative languages. So maybe that's not the best pitch, but I do believe with things like ES6 and ES7, we have rapidly evolving specs, but we have browsers that move a lot more slowly, and so we're interested in compiling these things. So I think this is a relevant topic to share with everyone. And so when we're interested in making our own languages, oh god, I need to turn off the timings. There we go. Now it's not going to jump ahead every two seconds. OK. When we're making our own languages, there are these tools that we can use off the shelf. But there's a lot going on under the surface. And if you don't understand what they're doing, the first time that you run into a problem, it'll be very difficult to debug. So first, I'm going to explain sort of the internals of all how this stuff works. And then we'll look at the tools you would use to not have to re-implement all of that yourself. But after we understand it, it'll be a lot easier to use them. But first, why do we even care about this? Why do we want to make new languages? Well, one reason is there is a lot of interest in cross-compiling from one language to another. And this could be things like CoffeeScript, or it could be various projects like Google Web Toolkit, which are compiling Java into JavaScript. Domain-specific languages can also be useful. So maybe you're a game designer and, or game developer, and your level designer wants to be able to script interactions. And they don't want to keep coming back to you with every request, but they're not a full-fledged developer themselves. So you can provide them a DSL they can use to uh, build these things more easily. It's also fun, and I think it improves your general knowledge as being a day-to-day -day programmer. You know, we all use tools like Browserify and Babel every day, and it's good to know how they work. But the big reason that we want to make new languages is that existing languages aren't adequate for the new trends we see, or there are new opportunities that existing languages aren't taking advantage of. So for instance, C was first developed when machines became powerful enough that we didn't need to optimize everything by hand. Or when people started wanting to build real-time distributed systems, Erlang was developed because existing languages like C didn't make that very easy. Or then you have languages that are being used beyond the scope of what people originally intended them to be used for. So CSS when it was first developed, was probably primarily used to change the font and background color on your dog's static HTML homepage. And now it's being used to change very complicated look and feel and animations of these big web apps. And so SAS was developed, because CSS just lacks the built-in features you need for that. And so this is my language I made up that we'll be working with in this talk. It's called LambdaScript. And Lambda Script does not solve any new problem in computing. <laughs> uh, what Lambda Script does do is have its entire grammar fit on one slide. <laughs> and so it's good for presentations. Additionally, there's enough content to talk about of how compilers work that if I also introduced a bunch of interesting new programming language ideas, the talk would become too unfocused. And so I've chosen something that's deliberately disinteresting. Or simple, is sort of maybe a nicer way to put it. <laughs> so this is the identity function in Lambda Script. If you've ever seen the Lambda calculus, this will look familiar to you. We're declaring a function named f. 
x is the argument we're taking, and then the body of the function is just returning x. This is what function application looks like in Lambda Script. So we are applying f to x, and then we are applying print to the result of that. And then here we have the largest Lambda Script program in existence. <laughs> Uh, it's a function that determines if a string is a palindrome or not, and then it just calls it a couple times to show that it's working. And so a couple things I'll point out about this. One is we have this somewhat funky syntax in here where we're using a regular expression as an indexer into a string. And so the way you evaluate this is you take the regular expression, apply it to the string, and the result of the whole expression is the first match group, or the empty string if that's not found. And so I don't actually know if this is a good feature to have built into your language or not. Maybe it's a cool thing that really helps people, or maybe it's just crappy bloat. When you are the language designer, you get to make these decisions and experiment with these new things and see if they work or not. Uh, another thing I'll point out is that you'll see there are a lot of these grouping operators. There are a couple of reasons for that. One is that when I was making Lambda Script, I had this uh, this idea that I wanted everything to be an expression and I wanted it to be as functionally pure as possible. And what I found out is that being ideologically rigid actually makes it very hard to make a grammar. Just like when you're writing in a language, being ideologically rigid can make it hard to write programs sometimes. And so you start to understand why so many languages are multi-paradigm, because it's just very hard to express everything in one set of ideas. Um, however, I also looked up Lisp, and I saw Lisp has similar ideas about having everything be an expression, and it also has a lot of grouping operators, and so I felt not so bad about that. But another reason that you'll see a few warts on Lambda Script is that I grew it very organically. So I would add a couple of features, and then I would see that it worked, add some tests, add a few more features. But then eventually, I would realize I had sort of painted myself into a corner. But because of those decisions I made earlier, I didn't really want to go back and undo all that work, so I would just sort of hack a little patch on and go along my way, and this is how software projects become bigger and bigger balls of mud. And so what I would recommend instead is to do a similar paper prototyping phase to what you would do for a user-facing web app or mobile app that you'd make. Because it's a lot easier to change things at lower fidelity. So the process I'd recommend is first, just write out some programs in your text editor. Don't worry about compiling them. And just see if some forms start to emerge that you're happy with. And then when you're like, OK, I know what my program should look like, then write out your grammar. Again, just in the text editor. Don't worry about compiling it. And parse it by hand. And this is not going to be quite as much fun as just slamming out a bunch of code. But when you realize that you've sort of trapped yourself, you can just go back and change the grammar and not be like, well, that was four hours of work to do those other rules, and so I'm not going to go back and change them. So if you have that discipline, I would highly recommend doing it. So we have our Lambda script, and we want to make the computer do something with it. And we're all humans, and so we have good pattern matching capabilities and pattern recognition, and we can start to see some structure in this. Even if we don't all know exactly what every line means, we can sort of get the idea. But to a computer, it's just a stream of text. And the job of the compiler is to teach the computer what the structure is of this text and convert it into a form the computer does understand. And that form that we're going to choose is JavaScript. And there are a number of other things we could do. We could output JVM or CLR or various other types of machine code. But I understand JavaScript better than I understand those things. And so that was a big reason for choosing it. Uh, but other reasons include JavaScript has a very robust ecosystem at this point. And so if we can compile the JavaScript, we can just hook into that pipeline and start taking advantage of all those tools. Additionally, it's ubiquitous in terms of where you can run it. You can run JavaScript on servers, on drones, on hardware. There are even some browsers that let you run JavaScript nowadays. So if we compile Lambda script to JavaScript, we already have a very wide install base of where we can use it. And so at this point, we have a decision to make, which is are we going to just do everything by hand, or are we going to use what's called a compiler compiler to make our compiler? 
And I chose to do both. And this gets back to what I was talking about earlier of if you understand how these things work internally, they're a lot easier to use. And the best way to understand how it works internally is to do it yourself for a small example. So the hand-rolled implementation is going to use F Sharp, and the uh, tool implementation is going to use TypeScript and JSON. So why did I choose F Sharp for a JavaScript conference? Well, I do like it quite a lot. It has type-safe composition of functions. A compiler is essentially just a big pipeline of functions, and so being able to express them in a type-safe way is really nice. The unit tests are really simple. It's easy to model everything as a pure function in a compiler, or almost everything. And so unit tests make that really nice to verify that it works. And finally, Hindley-Milner type inf inference is really great. If your idea of static typing is something like Java, where you have to tell the language every single type, then type inf inference feels really cool because you just tell it a couple types and it figures everything out, everything else out for you. So this is what the compiler looks like. We have all these different phases, and we're going to go through each one in turn. And the phases are divided up into two sections, the front end and the back end. And the front end is everything that the user of our language is going to see. So the syntax and the semantics and where do I put this semicolon, things like that. And the back end is the generation. So are we outputting JavaScript or JVM or CLR? And you can imagine a modular architecture where you can swap the two things out. So maybe tomorrow we'll add a JVM backend, and we don't need to change any of the parser logic. So the first phase is tokenizing. We take in the language, it's a string, and we want to emit a list of strings where each uh, member of that list is an atomically meaningful unit. So we're breaking up the program into its smaller chunks of meaning. And at this point, as language designers, we have some decisions to make. This is not a politically motivated presentation, by the way. I just thought this was a funny thing to put on the slide. Uh, is white space significant? So are we going to emit tokens for white space, or do we just ignore them entirely? How are string literals and comments delimited? So uh, when the tokenizer is going to have different rules, if it's in a comment, for instance, how do we know when we're in a comment? Do you have like a certain symbols to the end of the line? Do you have open and close? These are things we would have to know about at this point when we're designing our language. So here's what it looks like in F-sharp. And I would just focus on the unit test here. So we take in a string. That's the whole program, the identity function. And we output this list of strings. And the main way that we're doing this is we just have a regular expression. And we split on the input and say, OK, every place that there's a match, we're going to break it into two smaller strings. Can anyone find the bug in this approach? Um, yeah, that's, that's part of the problem. Yeah, that's a problem too. So this is not a sufficiently sophisticated approach. And so as some people were mentioning, if you have, let's say, a string where you have a quote, a character, a space, another character, and a close quote, well, this is going to be two separate tokens, because the space is one of the things in our regex. So we're going to split this into two, which is totally not what we want. So the problem is that we need to have sophistication where we know, like, OK, I'm in a string, and so I'm going to parse things differently based on that fact. Or I'm in a comment, and so I'm not going to be emitting tokens if I see like the function keyword. So this is an example where using a tool off the shelf would be helpful. Because when you're doing everything by hand, the only limit to how badly you can shoot yourself in the foot is your imagination. <laughs> There's, there are no guide rails sort of leading you in the right direction. And so we'll see later how we fix this in the JavaScript version. The next phase is doing lexical analysis. And the natural language metaphor is that we're figuring out what part of speech everything is. And so you can see here that some of these are just symbols with no parameterization. But others, we are going to parameterize information from the token. 
So for the func name, for instance, it's not useful to know that it's just a function name. We also need to know what the name of that function is so when we go to generate later, we can output the correct thing. And here we have a few more decisions to make as language designers, such as what characters are allowed in variable names. So we'll have code that looks at a string and says, is this a variable or not? And we need to add our logic for what a legal variable name is in our language. Are there any reserved words? So maybe we want to add the async key keyword to lamb descript eventually. But we don't want to do it now. We'd mark it as a reserved word so that no one can have it in their programs, and then we can do it without making it a breaking change. And so we would emit a reserved word lexical symbol and throw an error when we saw that. Or how do you write a decimal literal? Is it a dot, a D that goes at the end, or an F? Um, and so this is some, a decision you would have to make at this point in your program. And so here's the unit test for that. You can see we take in a list of strings, and we're outputting a list of lexical symbols. So that's pretty straightforward. And next, we have this list of lexical symbols, but we don't know what the relationship is between them. And so we want to parse it out into a concrete syntax tree. And you've heard about abstract syntax trees, pr presumably, and we'll get to that in a moment, but for now we're just doing a CST. And here we have a few more decisions to make, such as what are the allowable arguments to a function? So in Java, before 8, for instance, you could not pass a function to another function as an argument. That was part of the grammar. Or how do you apply a function to a value? In some languages, you use parentheses. In others, you just place one after the other. And what is the precedence of different operators? So if you write a times b plus c, what does that get evaluated to? And so to enforce all of these decisions, we need a grammar. And this is a book that I would recommend picking up if you are interested in this topic. And the author of this book writes, a grammar is a finite set of rules for generating an infinite set of sentences. And so this is our grammar for Lambda script, and as I promised, it does all fit on one slide. And the thing that uh, lets us generate an infinite set of programs from this is its recursive nature. And the way to read this is uh, on the left-hand side, that's a node in the tree, and its children are on the right-hand side. And this pipe means alternation. So a Boolean can be an expression, an equality symbol and an expression, or it can be a Boolean or a Boolean, and Boolean and Boolean. Those are different options for what it can be. And because it is recursive, we can just generate arbitrarily complicated structures with this. So you can see that an expression can be a function declaration, and a function declaration contains an expression. And so a note about grammars, in order to illustrate a point, I'm going to show you my favorite Stack Overflow question of all time. <laughs> Some of you might recognize this already. This is someone who's trying to parse HTML and they're reaching for regular expressions. And the reason this is my favorite Stack Overflow question of all time is because this is my favorite answer of all time. And I'll give you all just a moment to read this. So why is this answer so upset? Why are they talking about Tony the Pony and Zalgo and, and you know, your face melting off? And then why do they suggest an XML parser? How is that going to help anything? So the reason for this is the Chomsky hierarchy. And this is a ranking of how complicated grammars are based on what kind of rules you can have in the grammar. And as this uh, Venn diagram type thing suggests, if you have a parser that can parse, say, a context-free language, you can also parse regular languages. You can always parse something simpler. 
but you can't go the other direction, which is exactly what that asker was trying to do. Because HTML is a context-free language, and regular expressions are for regular languages. And so you can keep trying to like plug edge case after edge case, but just provably you're not going to get everything. Uh, of course, the flip side is that as you go up on the scale, the parsers get more and more complicated. So there's interest in proving where you are in the scale so you can have the minimally complicated thing to do your job. Uh, and so that's, that's the significance of the Chomsky hierarchy. Our language, like many other languages, is context-free. And one consequence of it being context-free is that you can't enforce type safety at the grammatical level because that requires some sort of context. And so you can inspect the tree later and figure out if it's valid with your type system or not, but you can't, uh, you can't enforce that as part of your grammar. So here's the grammar in F sharp, and we'll zoom in on just this one rule for the function declaration. And the way that we're going to parse this is using the bottom-up parsing algorithm. And the way this algorithm works is you have the parse stack, which is all the input you're looking at in this moment, and the unconsidered input, which is what you haven't looked at yet. And at each phase, you see if you have any rules that match what's on the parse stack. If you do, you apply that rule by what's called reducing it. And if you don't, then you shift or you take new input from the unconsidered input. And you just keep doing this until you run out of input. So at this first stage, we don't have any rules in our grammar that match the empty string. So we're going to grab some more input. And now we don't have any rules that match just the lambda. So we're just going to keep going. We don't have any matches. When we get to this point, we do have a match because this is a function declaration. This is that same snippet of lambda script we've been carrying through this whole time. So we're going to do the reduction and identify this as a function declaration. And now a function declaration can be an expression. So we're going to reduce by that rule as well. And at this point, we have no more input, and expression does not reduce any further. That's, you know, that's the end of the line in our grammar. And so we have to ask ourselves, is expression a valid top-level type? Because not everything in our grammar will be. So in JavaScript, for instance, if you just have key colon value, but it's not wrapped in the object bracket, that's not a valid JavaScript program. And so similarly, you could have a snippet where like, that is a, a good piece of a program, but the whole thing is not valid. In this case, expression is valid, so we will uh, return the, the tree, and we will say we have successfully parsed this program. And this is what it looks like in code. You can see we have a parse stack and our unconsidered input. We try to find a rule that we can reduce by. If we do find that rule, then we just recursively move on to the next step. If we don't find that rule, then we'll try to shift and take more input. If we don't have any more input, then we need to check if we're in an acceptable end state. And if we are, we return the tree. If not, we return an error. And if we do have more input, then we'll do the recursive next step with that shifted on. And one thing I'll point out, my error type here is none, which is the equivalent of null in JavaScript. This is actually awful, as I found out shortly after completing the compiler. Because when you put some code in and what you get out is null, it's incredibly frustrating and that's not remotely helpful as to telling you why your code is not valid. So what I would recommend if you guys were to do this is every phase that can reject the user input or fail in some way should have an incredibly detailed error type that will provide the user with some clues as to where they went wrong. And this is another reason that using a tool off the shelf can be more practical overall because they do have some error handling built in. And so one thing that you will see in your grammar is you might get shift-reduce conflicts. And when I first started encountering these, I thought I was doing something wrong. And it sort of is not great, but it's also very difficult to write unambiguous grammars. And so it is acceptable uh, because there are workarounds for it. And so the problem is in Lambda script, as we know, if you have one value followed by another value that's function application. And so here we have three values, and the question is, what order are we applying these functions? And you can see the two different parse trees that are both equally valid according to our grammar. 
And here it is with the grouping made explicit, just so you can see. Are we applying the first to the second and then applying the result of that to the third? Or are we applying the second to the third and then applying the first to that? And to look at it from the, uh, the bottom up parsing perspective, in this state, we have two expressions on the parse stack. And we have a third expression in the unconsidered input. So we can either shift or reduce, and they're both equally valid decisions to make at this point. There's no reason in the grammar that one is preferred to the other. And so the way tools get around this is they just choose by convention, I will always do one. So I will just always shift or I will always reduce. And then you can write your grammar and the conflicts are actually okay because you know what it's going to choose. This was a bit of a bump that I had going from my hand-rolled version to the JavaScript tool version is my tool was always reducing and that tool was always shifting and I didn't realize that that was being done differently and so there was a bit of confusion around that. So if you see a shift reduce conflict, that's what it means. You have a question? That's a really good question. I actually didn't find that in the grammar, uh, but that would be a very interesting thing to mention here. Uh, so the next phase is converting from a concrete syntax tree to an abstract syntax tree. So the concrete syntax tree has some extra syntactic elements in it, like the function keyword or the function dot, which we needed to do the parsing in the first place, but it's not, uh, it's sort of extra baggage when we're just trying to figure out what's the programmer's intent. Whereas the abstract syntax tree is just a semantic structure that tells us what the programmer was trying to do. And another benefit of this is you could imagine having multiple syntaxes for the same thing. And so that would be different con uh, yeah, concrete syntax trees, but those can all just convert into the same abstract syntax tree. And so tools that work on ASTs don't need to know about all the different syntaxes that feed into it. And so there are all sorts of things you can do with ASTs. And if you're interested in doing any of this for JavaScript, I recommend checking out the module Esprima which will parse JavaScript for you and give you the AST. So if you're using a tool like JSCS or JSHint, that's probably using a Sprema to analyze your code. And then if you're using JSX, there's a Sprema FB, which is the Facebook version of it that supports those extra language features. And so now that's done with the front end, and we're going to look at the generation side of things. So the first thing we need to do is convert our Lambda script AST into a JavaScript AST. And that's just a format you can see published online, and so it's easy to transform one tree into another to fit that format. And here's a unit test for that. And then next, we want to convert the JavaScript AST into JavaScript. And so here we have the compiled version of the identity function that we've been carrying through all of these examples. And in order to do this, we're going to use a library called ESCodeGen. ESCodeGen is the opposite of Esprima. So Esprima takes JavaScript code and gives you an AST. ESCodeGen takes a JavaScript AST and gives you JavaScript. And it lets you parameterize it and pretty print it or not or do whatever you want. And so if you're ever writing a code generation tool, Esprima is the, or ESCodeGen is a useful way to do it. And because F Sharp runs on .NET, we're using a library called EdgeJS, which allows you to call Node.js code from .NET. And it was actually shockingly simple to make this work. You can see, like, this is all the code here that I'm using to call Node.js from .NET. There's just a little bit of uh, async handling here. And usually these things are pretty finicky, so I was surprised when it basically worked the first time. So that's our hand-rolled solution. But as we were mentioning, there were a lot of problems with it. So we want to look at using a tool because a lot of these things have been solved before. And so you may have heard of things like Lex and Yak. There's also Bison, which is a C-based tool for making compilers, and Jison, which is a JavaScript port of that. And the key insight with these compiler compilers is that Grammar is separate from the parse logic. 
And so I'm not expecting you to necessarily read this code, but you can see that the two snippets, one is doing the actual parsing algorithm and the other is encoding the grammar rules, are completely decoupled. And so people realized, well, why are we writing the parser algorithm over and over again? I should just be able to specify my grammar and have someone else have a parser algorithm that uses that. And so Jison essentially takes over the entire front end of the compiler. And the way that Jison works is we save it as a dev dependency in our project, and then we call its executable on a Jison file, which has a special syntax that we use to specify all the rules of our language. And then that will output a common JS module, and we can require that from our JavaScript and then do whatever we want with it. We just have to get our code somewhere, and then we parse our code, and then whatever you've configured JSON to produce, you will now have on hand, and you can take it from there. You'll note that I chose to save it as a dev dependency, and that I'm saving it locally instead of globally, and there are a couple of reasons for this. One is that if I install it globally, then anyone else who works on my project is not going to be able to use it as easily. I have to like add that to the setup instructions, we have to be coordinating on the same version. And even though the main thing it gives you is this executable, you can still just install it as part of your project. You get the benefit of package.json specifying what version you want. And then you can just find it's executable in your node modules and be good to go. Additionally, it's only a dev dependency because you would not want to run this at runtime for your compiler. You just run it once, save the code it produces, and then you don't need to use JSON again at runtime. It's strictly a build time dependency. This is a tool I found by a guy named Nolan Lawson. It's a really sweet debugger for JSON files. So you put your file in, and in real time, you also put in what you're trying to parse, and it'll show you the tree, it'll show you the stream of symbols it found, and it'll show you the result of your parse. Uh, and so it makes it really easy to figure out where things are going wrong. You might recognize Nolan Lawson's name. He's the same guy who, a few months back, set off an internet flame war by declaring Safari to be the new IE8. Um, so I don't know what your opinions are on that, but this is a very nice tool. <laughs> and so now I'll just show you some comparisons between the, uh, the JSON and the hand-rolled version. So you can see if we're just doing a straight constant match when we're doing our lexical analysis, it's pretty similar. You have the thing you're matching on the left-hand side and you have the symbol you're emitting on the right. But when we're doing strings, which are more sophisticated, because we were pointing out, you know, you enter the, the quote and then you would want to look at things differently. So here things get a little more interesting. So you can see my crappy version on the left here is just doing this regular expression match but with JSON, we are able to specify a different set of lexing rules for different states. So when we see this open quote, we say, okay, we're entering the string state now. And when we're in the string state, only these rules with this string prefix apply. And so that basically allows us to say, just keep consuming characters until you see a close quote. And then you will leave the state. And so that provides a way for us to get around that regex problem that I had mentioned earlier. And so this is one way that Jison is sort of guiding us towards uh, a better solution and providing these tools. We didn't have to implement that sophistication ourselves. And then the grammar parsing also has a somewhat similar form. You specify the list of, uh, of tree elements that you're expecting to see. And then you have what's known as the semantic action here in the brackets. And what goes in these brackets is just any JavaScript snippet that you want, but you have all of these implicit variables that are just magically in scope that you can use. And when I first got used to this, it felt really weird to just have these things that were just there for you, and how would you ever know what they are, because the docs are kind of spotty, and there's no, like, scope object that you can console log out to see what you have available to you. So it's a bit of like shooting in the dark sometimes and or reading the like outputted JSON code to see what it's giving you. 
Um, but on the flip side, it is very concise. So, you know, this, this might get back to the keynote yesterday about is conciseness and simplicity and ease of use necessarily always the same thing. And so the way to read this is double dollar sign. That's the result of evaluating this node of the tree. And here I'm setting it to an object. And by doing this, we're going to build up our abstract syntax tree. But you could set it to anything you wanted. So like you could make it be a string, and maybe you're just outputting a JavaScript string directly. Or you know, maybe you have a, there's one, one of the examples is a calculator, and they're just outputting the numbers directly. And then these other variables, like dollar sign two, dollar sign three, these correspond to specific members of the sequence that you matched. And so you can see, for instance, dollar sign five matches the expression. And so the result here is going to be whatever double dollar sign was when we parsed out this E, this expression. And so this allows you to recursively build up this tree. And so it is a fair question to ask, why didn't I just output a JavaScript AST directly? Like, why did I make up my own AST format and then transform it? And that actually wouldn't have been an unreasonable thing to do, but I felt like if I was making my own language, I wanted to do something with it that was more than just syntactic sugar over JavaScript. And it felt like if my AST format was also the, JST, the JS AST format, that's really all it would be. So that's why I made my own format and then converted it later. I also use TypeScript for my code that wraps JSON. And I highly recommend using TypeScript. You're definitely going to run into a few bumps when you're starting it, just like any other new platform or ecosystem. But after you get over those initial learning curve moments, you know, I, I was detecting bugs in my program at compile time, which is something that I was not used to with JavaScript, and so that felt really cool. One way in particular that it helped is that the JavaScript AST, when I was doing the F-sharp version, it's just a big JSON, and so there's no inherent structure there. But in TypeScript, community volunteers have written out the type definition for that AST. And so I could know at compile time that what I was producing would be valid. And this made it much easier to do that transformation. And here you can see we're using a multi-line template string. This is one of the ES6 features that TypeScript provides. And so we're templating in this JS variable. And it's so much nicer to have multi-line strings in JavaScript finally than it is to concatenate a bunch of strings together or to use the multi-line NPM module, uh, which also just feels a little weird to me. I also added some syntax highlighting because no language is a real language until it has syntax highlighting. And so the way I did that is you have another implicit variable available to you that starts with an at sign. And that will give you line and column information about the match that was found for this grammar rule. And that allows you to go back later and find the spots in your program you need to be coloring. And so we do this in two steps. First, we have our AST, and we're going to visit every node in our AST using Traverse. Traverse is an excellent module by Substack, and it really simplifies the process of if you have some deeply nested structure, visiting each tree and either mutating it in some way, mapping it onto a new set of values, or reducing as we're doing here. And so we are just building up this set of color actions. So we're remembering, based on this this LOC property, which we're defining right back here, we're remembering where we need to go to color and then what color we want to use. And then in our next step, we order them all so that it goes from start to finish. And then we go through our original string and we splice it back together with the color applied. And so the reason we do this in two phases and the reason that we have to order it from start to finish is that when you color the string using the chalk module, you add extra characters to the string. And so that's going to ruin all of the other line and column information entries that you have. And so we can figure out what the offset is by decoloring the string and comparing that to the colored string. And then we know how much of a buffer we need. But that only works if you're going from the beginning to the end. And if you're just visiting the AST, you don't necessarily have a guarantee that that's going to work. And so that's why I had it in two separate phases. 
And so just a bit of analysis on these separate code bases. The lines of code for the JSON version with TypeScript was significantly less than the hand-rolled version, potentially not surprisingly. I mean, not only is it less code, but it's actually doing more. So like we fixed the string issue, we added syntax highlighting. One reason for this is as you can see, the tests are a really big contributor to the total lines of code because there's just so much logic that was in the hand-rolled version that I wanted to have good unit tests around. Whereas with JSON, a lot of that logic lives in a separate project, so you're not responsible for it anymore. And it's easy, you know, you just don't need to have those tests in your code base. And so a few other sort of pros and cons of using, doing it by yourself or using a tool. Doing everything by hand, you will definitely learn more. And so if your primary goal is just to learn about compilers, I would recommend going through it by hand. It's also more flexible. So as we pointed out earlier, uh, with that shift-reduce conflict, Jison just always chooses to shift. And if your grammar doesn't work with that, then you're just sort of out of luck and you need to make your grammar work with that. If you are controlling everything, then you have the flexibility to make decisions like that as you want. And finally, the tools just might not be available in your ecosystem. Maybe Jison doesn't work for you for whatever reason and then you're back to doing it by hand anyway. But using a tool has some important benefits as well. So it's more declarative, and there is that extra learning curve of how you use that syntax, but after you get over it, it's a very concise way to describe your language. It also makes it easier to add new features. So when I was doing the hand-rolled version, basically every new feature I added to the language, I would expose some new edge case in the compiler that I hadn't handled yet. And so it would be like an end-to-end -end process of like, okay, now I'll fix the bugs in this phase, now I'll fix the bugs in that phase. In JSON, those bugs are fixed already. And so it's just a matter of changing your JSON file, and then you can have new features in your language. There's less code to maintain, as we saw on the lines of code slide. And it just provides some guide rails, as we saw with things like the string, the string parsing. There's the natural features that you're gonna be reading about in the docs are sort of moving you in the right direction for not shooting yourself in the foot. So now I'll just show you a quick demo of this working with Jison. So this, oh bummer. All right, so here is our uh, Lambda script file. All right, so we have now run it. We've actually compiled our Lambda script and run it on the machine. And to show you that I'm not cheating, I will add, add some more, and then I'll change this to be not a palindrome anymore, so we'll see some different results. And so we are actually live executing Lambda script using TypeScript and JSON. And then we'll also show you Syntax highlighting because it's pretty. And again, this is what makes you having a real language. And you can see also, this is not just some pre-cached thing, it actually is highlighting what I just put into the editor. So this is on my GitHub, there's a link in the slides if you guys are interested in checking that out further. Cool. And so that is it. So now that you all know how to make your own programming languages, I'm excited to see what you all will make. Thank you. Are there any questions? Why do I name it Lambda script? So you'll notice that I had the Lambda as a keyword, which is like ridiculously impractical. Uh, but again, when you're making your own language, you can do silly things, because not many people have a Lambda on their keyboard. Um, so the Lambda calculus was my initial inspiration. And I like functional programming, and Lambda is a, a term that you use with functional programming. So that's why I need a Lambda script. Yeah, so the main benefit of Jison is that it is a JavaScript tool, and it works with the JavaScript ecosystem. Uh, if you have no problems using what, Jis what Bison produces and being like in the C world, then I don't think there's any, 
any benefit. Bison is actually, I think, more mature. Like it's a, a project that's more maintained. Jison is something that someone did for one of his class projects and kind of documented. Um, it's a very cool tool, but like, you know, it's, it's not gonna be quite as mature as Bison. Any other questions? Yeah? That could be a 50 minute talk. I, I actually, in preparing this talk, had considered like, should I try to explain the Lambda Calculus or just do the Lambda Calculus itself? I, like that would just be its own talk, but I will explain it briefly. Um, the Lambda Calculus, are you all familiar with Turing machines? So it's like, if something is Turing complete, you can compute anything with it. It's this very simple model of computation that can describe anything that is computable. So the Lambda Calculus is that same thing, but coming at it from a different direction. And they're, they're provably the same, and in the Lambda Calculus, it's basically like a programming language where all you have are functions, applying functions to values, and uh, like having parameters, essentially. So like you can have a function and you substitute that value in every place the parameter is listed in your function. And with those three things, you can make anything that you can compute. It's, you know, mind-bendingly difficult to think about, just like with a Turing machine when you're doing like a real thing, but that's sort of the, the basis of a lot of functional programming um, patterns. Any other questions? All right, thank you all for listening. <laughs>